Okay, um, so today, today, what Sunday is this? Today, can everybody see this? This is so nice, built by Brandon. Should we give you a round of applause just because, you know, why not? You know? I mean, just beautiful, just beautiful. We do not have that in the Young Marrieds ministry. I'm uh, associate pastor in the Young Marrieds ministry, for those of you who don't know me, and teach about 150 freshmen at Christian High. I teach them the Bible, the story of Scripture. You could pray for me on that, okay. But I know a lot of you guys. You guys are awesome. I love speaking to you guys. I love this group. So uh, what's today? What is this about? Um, you might have a lot of questions, as you might notice. This, it's completely my fault um, that it says, Pastor George put that, questions go here, but then I just forgot to erase it. But I'm going to play with it and just say, you might have a lot of questions after what I say, um, so you're going to put them right there. And... Give me some feedback. Um, Turn these back in. I'll I'll grade them uh, this week. No, just kidding. Uh, The back, too, especially, too. See, if you flip it like this, Brandon, boom. See, the notes are, now it says notes on top. So technically, see, that's that's pretty cool, you know. So anyways, um, now that we're past the, um, yeah, the difficulties that it is, how difficult is it to print out a bulletin? Um, Let's talk about good, (laughs) let's talk about good friends, good friends. So Pastor George, note from Pastor George, he said, this is verbatim, uh, and I quote, um, we need to talk about what does it mean to be in a community, to be in a community. I just happen, you know, because I'm cool like that, to um, have this pulled up on Google, which, if you guys don't know, is the source for everything in the universe. Um, So uh, community, as defined by Google, is a group of people living in the same place or having a particular characteristic in common. Okay, that's pretty general. That encompasses everyone. Uh, Secondly, a feeling, uh, I like that, okay, a feeling of fellowship with others as a result of shared common attitudes, interests, and goals. So... um, This is Good Friends Sunday. Obviously, a lot of our friends come from our close-knit communities, and we are part of this Christian, believing community. But for a second, I want to contrast maybe some of our non-Christian communities to then what we'll talk about today, which is Christian community. So um, does anybody live in like an apartment complex or somewhere that has rules? Yeah, okay. So yeah, my my parents, they kind of have some issues with, I mean, if you park your car like on the street in a weird way that you'll get a message from the HOA. If your barrels are left out longer, you will get a message. If you, if the, if, okay, so one time it was the cord from the direct TV dish was not the same color as the paint of the house. So then you have to paint the direct TV dish cord. So, so that communities, I mean, shared particular characteristics in common, everybody has in common, they must submit to the authority of the community. But normally what do communities, maybe just think for a second in your own mind, what communities am I a part of? Communities have uh, shared values. They have shared beliefs. Obviously, you're, um, I mean, why not? Let's just get political. If you're going to be a Democrat or Republican, um, you're probably going to look at the party platform and you're going to be like, am I, do I subscribe to this community? I mean, you can't be a part of a lot of communities without subscribing to their beliefs. Um, just looking at my friend Nathan back there, you know, we're rivals at heart because he went to Clemson. I went to the University of South Carolina. We do not like each other. No, I'm just kidding. We like each other. No, no, no. Nathan's a great guy, but he's part of a Clemson. You, t- you told me there's a Clemson San Diego community, right? Where you can like watch Clemson football and stuff like that. It's boo. That's bad. Okay. Um, <laughs> Anyways, so there's communities all over. You can be, you can be, excuse me, you can be in a college community, uh, alumni community. You can be in a HOA community. Um, these are our various communities. I mean, and as I was thinking about this yesterday, I'm like, I just happened to type in on none other than Google, like, how do I like make friends in a community? And there's like, there's so much information on like how to be part of communities and how to make friends. And there's online communities and non-online communities. There's communities based on race and identity and all types of stuff. So you can tell our society is really in need of friendship and community. That's, that's a deep-seated thing. And when you add the word feeling, like one of the definitions, a feeling of fellowship, everybody wants to feel good. Everybody wants to feel like they belong. I think historically, if you would ask people like in the 15th, 16th century, they'd be like, my community is my family. My community is my village. My community is, I mean, you're pretty much locked 
in the situation that you're in, where today we have so much autonomy over our life and we can move wherever we want. And if California gets too expensive, we just move to Texas or we just move whatever. And so now we just insert ourselves into a new place and we're just like, this is my community now. But then we're also, I mean, we're also like extremely lonely and we have all these communities. Maybe because we're so you know, fractured in our society with our beliefs and our values. I don't know. But it's, it's interesting to me that maybe community is a modern problem. Does anybody else think that? I mean, we, we, maybe it's because of choice. Maybe it's, we have so much choice. We have to choose our communities. We need that fellowship. I don't know. But it's a fascinating subject to cover. So let's talk about um, what the Bible says about community. It's, it's pretty cool. Um, when you look at the book of Acts, there's kind of a a brand new era in biblical redemptive history that stretches to today. We're still in this community today. What am I talking about? Um, If you're a believer today and you're a Christian, you're part of the new covenant community. For real. Um, If you would have told me that, you know, 10 years ago as a Christian, before I went to seminary or did any study of the Bible, I'd be like, I'm part of a what covenant? I don't, new covenant? What does that mean? Was there an old one? Like, I didn't know. I just thought... You accept Jesus, and that's it, you know. Um, But apparently, (laughs) the good news is God has not left us uh, high and dry when it comes to community. He has put us in what's called the New Covenant community. So we're going to look at that. I mean, before we get into what the New Covenant is, we have it presupposes what? An Old Covenant community. What was the Old Covenant community? That was centered around the Mosaic Law and the Mosaic Covenant, the people of God, Um, in the Old Testament were were Israel. And the history of Scripture teaches us that Israel was God's people. He had many covenants with them, but the one in particular, which was temporary, was called the Old Covenant. It was based on a whole bunch of laws. They had to follow those laws to be blessed in the Promised Land. And then, uh, if they did not follow those laws, they were going to be cursed or come under consequences. So it was kind of a national covenant for them, and they were God's people. Gentiles, that's everybody who's a non-Jew, that's all of us, uh, were not God's people. Doesn't mean Gentiles never believed, um, but they were not God's people. But when Jesus comes and his death, burial, and resurrection kind of inaugurate this new era, and this new era is really interesting. So in the book of Acts, we see the early church, the sending of the Holy Spirit, Jews and Gentiles coming together in one new community, there's the word, and what's going on with them? Well, the New Covenant uh, promise prophesied by Ezekiel and Jeremiah in the Old Testament promised these things. And this is what we're dealing with today if you're a Christian. All the way back at the beginning, the start of the church to today. So to be a Christian in this New Covenant community, you have a new heart and new mind. That's, that's basic. So you have brand new affections. The Ephesians would say prior to being a Christian, you're dead in your trespasses and sins. And then you, when you believe Christ, you are made alive. You are made alive in Christ. So you, while we think we're just totally living and it's awesome and I thought I was alive, um, to God, we are dead. But when you accept Christ and you believe, you are now alive. You have a brand new heart, new mind. The Bible calls you a new creation. So you have new affections. So something's working on the inside of you that says, I want to love God and love others. So that's the first part. The second part is... That law of the Old Covenant is fulfilled, and it's written on your heart. Okay, that's weird. How does that work? I didn't know my heart had tattoos on it or or writing on it. Um, It's a metaphor for what has happened to you in Christ. And if you read the New Testament, the Apostle Paul is obsessed with the phrase in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. What it means is that everything he accomplished and everything he did in his life is attributed to you. You are in him. You are housed under the dwelling place of Christ's likeness and therefore his perfect obedience to the law, to the old covenant, is your perfect obedience. His death on the cross and punishment for sins was your death on the cross. He was punished for your sins. His resurrection is your resurrection. His new life is your new life. So if you're in Christ, if you're part of this community, all those laws have been fulfilled in your place. Christ did them for you. That's why People like myself, very tragically, have spent years trying to make laws out of Christianity and fulfill laws when really there's nothing we can present to God um, of ourselves, of our own righteousness through laws that he will accept. He doesn't accept anything but perfect 100% righteousness from the time you're born 
And don't tell me at three years old you weren't doing some stuff, okay? Because I got a three-year-old. I got a five-year-old. You did some stuff then. Maybe you're perfect now. But at some point from the time you're born to the time you die, you transgress God's law. And in so doing, you bring wrath and condemnation upon yourself. That's what the scripture teaches. So when Christ dies in your place, you're being credited with the life that he lived, his perfect righteousness. So if you're part of the new covenant community, the law is already written on your heart. It's fulfilled. Deep breath. We're okay. We, the law is fulfilled. There's nothing that we have to do to make God love us more. That's an amazing truth. God's spirit. Next, God's spirit, Holy Spirit, is placed within his people. So God can dwell with you now in an intimate way in your heart because you are clean. You're declared righteous. You're a new creation. You are his child. So if you are part of this new covenant community, meaning Christian community, um, you have God's spirit within you. There's nothing special you have to do, no hoops you have to jump through. God loves you. He dwells with you. This is cool because I used to think God was like up there and I'm down here. Like, wow, if I could just have a conversation. When you realize, when you read the New Testament, that he's not up there and you're down here, he dwells with you. He hears, um, hears everything. He hears your prayers, he hears your thoughts, he hears your speech. It even says in Romans, he can hear and know and understand your groans. The Holy Spirit, when you are just so stressed and depressed and have anxiety that you're like, I don't even know what to say. The Holy Spirit can translate that to God. God knows those things. And lastly... We've already touched on it. Total forgiveness of sins, past, present, and future. So the New Covenant community here at Shadow Mountain. Shadow Mountain is a New Covenant community. Every believing Christian community is a New Covenant community. These are the characteristics of the people in that community. So today, if we're talking about community, I don't know any other community worldwide that has these things going on in them. Pretty cool. I mean, what community has every single person there with a new heart and new mind, a new creation, new affections? I mean, they can claim the same thing we can, that we're not perfect. Everybody knows that. But what's going on in the Christian community is the Spirit of God working in the people of God, releasing all of the burdens of their sin, and then making them more like Christ, and then showing them ways to love God and love others because the law is already fulfilled. That's a special, special community. So if you're if you're on the fence or maybe you're like, I don't know if I have a new heart, new mind. I don't know if this is me. Then today's your day. Today is your day to say, is this my community, the new covenant community? Have I trusted Christ in my heart? Because this is the first priority for everybody who lives on this planet to realize God has done something new and you can be a part of it by believing in Christ. So let's look at the Christian community historically. This is probably the things that would define us. As a community, but remember I said communities are shared values and beliefs, right? So what are the shared beliefs or values historically um, for Christianity? And this is kind of fun. I mean, it's, I, do, I like to poke holes or fun and other things, but, you know, you can look at other communities around the world. What other community can say, yeah, for 2,000 years we've shared these values and beliefs? I don't know many. So the Christian community can claim that can claim that for 2,000 years, we have been gospel-centered. We have been gospel-centered. Let's pull up Acts, the book of Acts. Jesus Christ comes proclaiming the gospel, the kingdom of God, his death, burial, and resurrection. And in the book of Acts, he says uh, to the apostles, um, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. What are they witnesses to? death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, the gospel. Paul says it in 1 Corinthians. He says um, what the gospel, for for those of us who uh, need to know, like, hey, what exactly is the content of the gospel? Um, Paul says, I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which you received. I delivered to you that which uh, was of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. He was buried, and he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. So it it starts with Christ. It goes to the apostles. The apostles instill this idea. I mean, the the apostles are so singular in focused. They say things like, um, um, it would be 1 Corinthians, not 2 Corinthians. They say things like 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Verse 2, I determine, this is Paul, I'm determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. 
Why is that? Because that's the gospel. That's the power unto salvation. That content, the preaching of the gospel and the content in that gospel is what people hear, they believe, and they become part of the new covenant community. So we have been gospel-centered for over 2,000 years now. It's very special. There's a content to that, that gospel. There's doctrine to that gospel that we hold near and dear to our hearts. What's, what's that? That, God, that Jesus is truly God and truly man without sin. He's fully God, fully man without sin. We hold that near and dear to our heart. People in church history have died for those truths. It's hard for us to believe today. Um, but people in church history have given their life for the fact that Jesus is divine, that he is God, and they were willing to give their life for that truth. Secondly, what are, what are we talking about? We're Christ-centered. Clearly, the gospel is about Christ. So this community, this church, is about Christ. It's about preaching Christ crucified, his death, burial, and resurrection. It's about worshiping Christ in spirit and in truth. Jesus says it in the gospels. He meets the woman at the well. Who's familiar with that story? Woman at the well. And he tells her that the Father is looking for those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. How do you do that? You're part of the new covenant community. You have the spirit of God dwelling in you. You're a new creation. And in truth, you hold fast to the word. Lastly, it's we're word-centered. So one of the reasons why I think the Christian community has been so resilient throughout time, and trust me, folks, I mean, we could go through, through church history and you could see the pressure that has been put on Christians from rulers. And so we think it's tough today go back to before Constantine in the third century. I mean, there was some persecution like you've never seen. And one of the reasons why they hold fast is because of the word of God. The truth was so transformative to them, they were willing to die for it. They were willing to sacrifice anything for it. So our community has been gospel-centered, Christ-centered, and word-centered for over 2,000 years. Where else can you find that? That's pretty cool. That's a pretty cool heritage. You have a pretty cool family If you're a believer today, it's a line that goes all the way back to the apostles and the early church and to Christ himself. So what do we do with this? How do we apply this? If you're part of Shadow Mountain Community Church and you're in this community and you're like, I'm a believer, I I hold fast to the gospel and to Christ and to his word, then it's time to understand how to live in the world. And the scripture says, Jesus says, we need to be salt and we need to be light. So this community, this church, you should be hearing the proclamation of the truth and it should be transforming your mind and you should be going out and living as salt and light in the world. What does that look like? This is where it gets difficult because some people say, well, I can't say that I'm a Christian or I can't get into these conversations with people. In my experience, for me personally, these next two, be humble in heart and compassion, practice the compassion of Christ, are the most important things for me with regard to evangelism or with regard to the world at large, bringing people into the Christian community. Without compassion and humility of heart, I fail. And I think I talked about this a long time ago when we were going through Colossians, um, and I gave you an example of what I was wearing on the first day of high school, my junior year, and I was very self-conscious. I don't know if you can remember that, but the story goes, I was so full of myself and what I looked like and how I was doing and how I needed friends and how I need to take care of number one that it was impossible for me to have compassion on others. Or I wasn't humble enough to be able to see somebody who was sitting by themselves who looked like they needed a friend in the moment. So what's the Achilles heel, even for Christians, which God will work out, you know, if some, sometimes he works it out in difficult ways to get our attention, but God, he did that to me. God will work out um, and work through you in compassion and humility so that when you see somebody else, you say, you know, what's well, five minutes? Let me build a conversation with this person. Let me talk to this person. This person looked like they, can, they need a pat on the back. They need some encouragement. People are going through difficult times. Maybe you stop and just say, hey, how are you doing? You know, good to see you. Or would you like to get a coffee or something like that? It's an other's focus that that's what this community at Shadow Mountain, that's what the New Covenant Christian community stands for. And that's how other people come into this community. It's not necessarily by, by being a street preacher or going up to people and be like, you need to accept Jesus. It really comes through relationships where they see you being salt and light, the love of Christ, the compassion of Christ, the humility of your heart, and people are like, wow, there's a difference there. There's a difference in that person. And I'll leave you with this, obviously. This is one of the most important things um, 
to me, and I know that it's very easy for me to forget. I, I forget what I'm supposed to be. I forget the truth that uh, makes me who I am. Why? Because I'm a finite human being uh, who sins and we're prone to wander. Can I get a witness? Who knows that song? So what do we need to do? If you're like, yes, I want to be that. I want to be part of this young adult community. I want to be part of the New Covenant community. I want to be part of the greater Shadow Mountain community. And I want to be a, a salt and light in the world. How do you invite people in? How do you do that? You've got to start with your mind. All your actions flow forth from your beliefs. Notice all the social activities that worldly communities do stem from what? What they believe. What their values are. If you're, a society, if you're a society of people who care about uh, love and compassion, what are you going to do? You're going to go feed the homeless. Because that, your core belief is we want to love and care for others. So then it's going to act out in that way. So what do you believe? What do we believe as Christians? If you're like, well, Jesus, that's about it. We need to know more than that. We, we need to go deeper than that. We need to understand who God is. When we see more of who God is, it transforms who we are. What, the reason why Christians do philanthropy, giving, good things, all that stuff, is not man-centered. It's not because it's like, hey, we want to placate God so he can bless us. Or we want to, um, we, we basically want blessings from God. We want to feel good in ourselves. The reason why Christians do it is because we look at our God. And our God gave sacrificially, selflessly of himself on the cross. We see our God, we're like, wow, I'm in love. <laughs> this, is, this is the greatest thing in the world this God, this Savior right here. And it, then you go out, and in your life, you're like, selflessly give of myself to this person. Selflessly give of my time here. Selflessly do that. And people are like, what's in it for you? See, you can't explain what's in it for you because what's in it for you has already been done on the cross with Christ. So if your mind is transformed by the word of God and you're consistently in it and you're consistently learning more, this community, the Shadow Mountain community, the New Covenant community will grow. The preaching of the word of God, just the last thing I'll say in the book of Acts, the, the Christianity did not move forward at all without the proclamation of the word, with truth. And that word had content. This is who Jesus is. He's son of David. He, he was raised by the Holy Spirit. It had content there. Do you know that content? Do we care about that content? Christianity is not just, hey, good deeds, don't worry about the words. No, there's content there that's transformative of our mind, and then it transforms our actions. Christianity exploded at the beginning. Why? Because of that content, that word was preached. People heard it. They believed it. Shared values and beliefs. There's a strong community and they've survived for 2,000 years. That's amazing through intense stuff. So let me pray for us. 22 minutes. Let me pray for us and then we'll spend some extra time talking today and we have good food today, right? We have amazing food made by Brandon Larson himself. He's been slaving all morning in the kitchen, and he made this food. Let's give him a round of applause. That's a total lie. Okay, but anyways, okay, let's pray. Lord God, thank you so much for the opportunity to be together.